Every one of you for joining us. Uh, Tony Nijme is here with us. He has taken time off his busy schedule. He works with assists with the mission work here at the church, and I want to thank him for being with us today. This program would not have been possible without the uh, support and cooperation of Pastor Daniel Downey. Unfortunately, he could not be here with us tonight because of a prior commitment, but his help is greatly appreciated. Tony, would you please bless this program with an opening prayer? Thank you, Ariana, for inviting me and being honored here to be with you tonight. Uh, before I pray, before we pray, I just wanted to, God, I was talking to Michael, 
And this is a verse dear to my heart because when I started working in the mission here for Venture, is this is the verse that really uh, kind of, you know, you know, give me the passion to do what I'm doing. And basically, is this is one of the only uh, books in the Bible, the chapters or the books ends with a question. And this is the same question that God spoke and asked 3,000 years ago. And I think it's the question God continued to ask that question to each and every one of us. And this question is, uh, in Jonah, in Jonah uh, the, uh, uh, at uh, the last two verses of the Bible, uh, of the chapter, he said, I should not, uh, <clears throat> uh, so he, as we all know, Jonah's story, and Jonah was angry with God because he saved the Assyrian people. And so Jonah was upset of the, over the plan that came overnight and died overnight, and he's so upset about it. And then the question came to Jonah from the Lord, and he said, And should I not have concern for a great city of Nineveh, in which there were more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the question still ringing today and asking, should not we care for the Assyrian people or any people? So God's heart of mercy and compassion for all people. And God even chose Jonah, which is, was an enemy of the Assyrian people, chose and to send him to Jonah to ask, you know, to repent. And actually they did repent. And God had compassion over them and loved them and, and relented and not destroyed them. So tonight, as we hear the story about the Assyrian people, we will let us lift up, uh, bow our head and pray. Uh, thank you, Father, Lord, for your compassion, for your love, for your grace, for your people all across the world. Father, you have kind heart that you seek not anyone to be perished, but all to have come into an everlasting life. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters, the Assyrian people in Iraq and Iran and all that region who are going under many sufferings and attack by the enemy. Father, Lord, we ask you, we lift them up to you, and we ask you that you come and aid them in a time of need. And Father, we know that we're not coming to anyone, a king or uh, a president, but we're coming to the kings of kings and lord of lords. We come before you in the power of your, your son, Jesus, that we ask you that you come. And Father, open our hearts and minds uh, to be compassionate to our brothers and sisters and, and lift them up in prayers as we on a daily basis for to see God and the power of the Holy Spirit intervene in that Middle East and especially among the Assyrian people. I thank you, Father, because you have answered and you will continue and you will deliver your people 3,000 years ago, but you will deliver them today. And we trust you and we believe you and we love you, Lord God, because you have your compassionate Lord. Thank you, Father, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. This program is sponsored by the Assyrian Christian Compassion Ministry, SCCM. The topic is War on Christianity in the Middle East, the Case of the Assyrians. My name is Arya Nishaya, and the SCCM team has asked me to be a guest speaker for part of this program. SCCM was established in 2012, and later on you will learn about it a little bit more. This program um, has four parts. In the first part, I will be talking about who the Assyrians are, and how and who is persecuting them. In part two, we will watch a video. In part three, Mr. Amiri will introduce the SCCM team to you and talk about its activities. Part four is a 15 minute question and answer period. And the program will conclude with the Lord's Prayer in Assyrian. And I hope by then you will be ready to get up and enjoy the traditional Assyrian um, refreshments that have been prepared for us. Fasten your seat belts. We are going on a virtual journey to the biblical land of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel was built. Today it is called Iraq, but this is a map of the land of Shinar. Now here on this map you see Ur, 
where Abram was called to go to the promised land. This is Babylon, where Daniel and his friends lived in the ba palace of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. But our destination is up the Tigris River all the way to the city of Nineveh. Tony already gave away what I was going to ask. Um, as you know, um, Jonah very reluctantly gave the message of repentance to the Ninevites. And I think they believed in Almighty God because we read that as soon as the king heard the message, he wore sackcloth and ordered all his subjects to do the same and to pray and to fast for three days. Consequently, the Lord spared the city from total destruction. To this day, the Assyrians commemorate the rogation of the Ninevites. The event is on the liturgical calendar of the official Assyrian church. It calls for praying and fasting, and usually it falls in the month of February. The Ninevites were Assyrian. When I tell my American friends that I'm an Assyrian, they begin to call me Syrian, not realizing that these are two different nations. So let me explain the difference. Syrians are inhabitants of the country of Syria. Most of them are Arab, and they speak Arabic, and the majority are Muslim. This is a map of modern Iraq, and as you will see, Syria is located to the west of Iraq. But Assyrians are indigenous to northern Iraq, the area that is called the Plain of Nineveh, and actually the area extends into the southeastern Turkey. Since pre-Christian times, there have been large settlements of Assyrians in northwestern Iran. So even though the region is divided politically among three countries, Iran, Turkey, and Iraq, geographically speaking, the homeland of the Assyrians is a single region. Besides territorial distinctions, the Assyrians speak a version of the Aramaic spoken by Jesus. Now, as you entered the hall, you heard the, the, the Lord's Prayer chanted in the Aramaic exactly uh, as Jesus would have said it. The version of Aramaic that Assyrians speak is called Modern Assyrian Aramaic. Both versions are written in a script that is called Syriac. And I have the alphabet, the four first letters of alphabet there. And the language uh, is, uh, the script is uh, read from right to left. In terms of biblical gene genealogy, the Assyrians are descendants of one of the sons of Shem called Ashur. Now, you might ask, when did the Assyrians become Christian? They were converted to Christianity very early in the history of Christianity. They were converted by uh, Apostle Thomas, one of the 12. And we learned that as early as the year 100 AD, there was a church in the Assyrian city of uh, Edessa, located in, today in southeastern Turkey. And the church was called the Church of the East. Actually, officially today, uh, the official church, uh, the Assyrian church is called the Assyrian Church of the East. And the reason why it was called the Church of the East was to distinguish it from the church in the West in the Roman territory. Later on, this uh, church became uh, nicknamed Nestorian in a pejorative sense because the church members believed, unlike the Roman Catholic rite, uh, 
They believe that Mary is the mother of Jesus and not the mother of God. And by the same token, they maintain that Jesus on earth was both man and God. I guess they were the first Protestants. <laughs> the Hasidian Christians have had a remarkable history as Christians. I will only mention a few examples. The first is the book of Dia Tesseron. And this was written by an Assyrian who openly uh, proclaimed himself to be an Assyrian. He was a theologian, and he wrote the very first harmony of the Gospels. This became a very authoritative source in the early church, and it was um, translated into uh, several languages. The second legacy that I would like to mention was the missionary zeal of these early Christians. They took the message of gospel all the way along the Silk Road to India, China, and Japan. Now, here we have a picture of Dia Tesseron. This one is the Arabic translation dating back to the 11th century AD. This one is a, an English translation. Now, the mission church in India has survived up till today. And it is called the Assyrian Church of India. And currently, the metropolitan that resides there is Dr. Mar Eprim, and the place of residence is in Kerala, India. Next, I talked uh, about the mission church in China. There are several monuments and manuscripts that, that attest to the existence and the strength of this church in China. I have picked a manuscript written on rice that dates back to the 7th century AD. This church was very strong uh, during the Tang Dynasty in China, dating from 6th to 8th century AD. The reason why I picked this uh, slide is because uh, it's in two languages. The top one, of course, is Chinese, but the bottom one is in Aramaic. And as my friends and I, we tried to read the script, we found out that these were the name of the uh, metropolitans that served in that church during various decades. Fervor of Assyrians for missionary work continues up till today. In 1951, Reverend Ken Joseph was one of the persons who answered General Douglas MacArthur's call for missionaries to go to Japan to help it recover from World War II. So, Reverend Ken Joseph took his family, went to Japan, and over there when he introduced himself, the Japanese said, oh, we know you, your ancestors. They were here in the fifth century AD. Now, this is a family picture of Reverend Ken Joseph. This is his eldest son. His name is Ken Jr. He, took, he succeeded his father, and now he is the minister of a Protestant church in Tokyo, um, Japan. He is also the founder and director of the Japan Helpline a worldwide 24-hour emergency hotline and relief assistant organization. And at the same time, he's the founder and director of the Japan-based Kyoko Institute, which studies the historical roots of Christianity in Asia. And even though he was born and raised in Tokyo, he's a staunch Assyrian nationalist, and he's very much aware and active in what's going on uh, in the persecution of Assyrians today. Okay, let's come back from the mission field and go into the Middle East, and we want to know what has been the history of these Assyrian Christians uh, in their homeland. 
what we find out is that they have really had a very precarious existence in the Middle East. There have been periodic religious cleansings. I will mention only a few, and I will restrict myself to the 20th and 21st century. During World War I in 1918, Turkey declared jihad. Jihad means holy war against its Christian subjects because they were suspected of being sympathizers to the Allied powers. And for this reason, scores of Pontic Greeks, Armenians, and Assyrians were massacred. The Assyrians suffered the most because they lost two-thirds of their population. Not only that, they were also uprooted and had to live in refugee camps for a couple of years. The second incident that I would like to mention dates to 1933. It's called the Massacre of Semele. And this happened at the wake of Iraqi independence from British mandate. The Assyrians were targeted because they had found jobs in the British establishments. And they were also conscripted to serve in the colonial army. So in the region of Semeli, close to 6,000 unarmed men, women, and children were murdered. Consequently, the French government gave a safe haven to the Assyrians of Iraq, to some of them, not all of them, and resettled them in Syria, in the country of Syria, along the Khabu River in 37 villages. The Semele massacre has become the Assyrian National Martyrs' Day. And it is commemorated on August 7, worldwide, every year. The next event happened in 2003, and so now we are in the 21st century. And this happened after the fall of Saddam Hussein. The Christian population fell prey to radical Al-Qaeda groups. So there were numerous incidents of massacre, kidnappings, and bombing of churches during Sunday services, all of which have been documented in the news media. How about ISIS? Well, when ISIS took over Mosul in 2014, the Christian homes were marked, and the Christians were given two choices, either convert to Islam or pay the heavy tax that is called jizya. If they refused to convert, they were beheaded. If they could not afford to pay the jizya, the parents and the children were sold into slavery. And this way, funds were raised for these radical groups. The atrocities committed against Christians included, and still include, crucifixion, torture, and rape. Churches are destroyed, and thousands of archaeological treasures are dismantled, wiping out the history of early Christianity in that region, as well as the pre-Christian Assyrian archaeological heritage. They say that sometimes a picture can speak louder than a thousand words. So let's look at some pictures. This one <clears throat> is the picture of a lone man praying in a completely destroyed sanctuary. These are dis destitute women praying for help. This is a before and after picture of St. George Church in the town on Bartella. You notice that in the lower picture, the, the sanctuary has been smoked. These are the pictures of three Assyrian men who refused to convert to Islam, and they were beheaded. This is a little boy who has learned at a tender age the posture of surrendering. 
And this is a condemned Assyrian man because he wears a cross. These are refugees from the Mosul region after the ISIS takeover. Notice the cross on the refugee tent. Most Americans have heard that it's ISIS and Qaeda who have been waging war against Christianity in the Middle East. But that is not all. You will be surprised to know that the Kurds that also live in northern Iraq where Assyrians live, they terrorized the Assyrian Christians into giving up their farms and homes to the Kurds. The Kurds have established vast settler colonies in Assyrian lands. In Iraq today, the Assyrians in the cities like Baghdad live in fear of various Islamic factions that are at war with one another. In Syria, the Syrian rebels that the American government is supporting are another group, particularly al-Nusra, has a lot of Christian blood in its hands. These rebel groups have targeted Assyrian settlements in Syria. It is through the slave trade and kidnapping for ransom that these groups raise some of the funds for their operations. Let us turn off to the second part of this program and watch a video. Assyrians have been the victims of persecution for centuries, including the Assyrian Genocide, in which the Ottoman Turks killed at least 500,000 Assyrians during World War I. Today, the atrocities still continue. The Assyrian people continue to suffer at the hands of the Islamic State. ISIS demands that Christians living under its control take down their crosses and pay the jizya, a tax on religious minorities. Those who do not pay face a choice between exile and death. ISIS has also attacked Assyrian villages, killing or imprisoning hundreds. Assyrians are Christians. The Assyrians spread Christianity and sparked a spiritual fire that burned across the entire Middle East. However, with the rise of radical Islam, the Assyrian people received persecution, which still continues today. The attack on Christianity continues. Yet another victim of the Islamic State group's relentless destruction of ancient cultural sites, the oldest Christian monastery in Iraq has been reduced to a field of rubble. For 1,400 years, the compound survived assaults by nature and man. Recently, it stood as a place of worship for U.S. troops. Generations of monks tucked candles into the niches and prayed in the cool chapel in early centuries. 
Now, satellite photos obtained exclusively by the Associated Press confirm the worst fears of church authorities and preservationists. The monastery, called St. Elijah's Monastery of Mosul, has been completely wiped out. On June 10, 2014, after the Iraqi and Kurdish armies abandoned their posts, Iraq's second largest city, Mosul, became defenseless. This forced more than 600,000 Assyrian Christians, Yazidis, and other minorities to immediately flee Mosul and the Nineveh Plains. Salmenti far sofaita, blahid shikuta, ina jaraim genocide, ina tathir arti wadini. Genocide of Assyrian Christians in Iraq continues in Syria. ISIS attacked 35 Assyrian villages in the Hasaka province. At least nine Assyrians were killed defending these villages, 300 Assyrian women and children were captured, and over 3,000 Assyrians have fled from the villages and are now in shelters across Hasaka province. <laughs>
In light of recent attacks by ISIS, the Assyrian people are standing up all over the world and taking protests and demonstrations to the streets. The Assyrians remember the brutal genocide they faced just a little over a hundred years ago and it seems to be all happening again in the hands of ISIS. The Assyrian people are asking the international community for assistance to defeat these genocidal terrorists. Will the United Nations stand up and help them? Save Christians in Iraq! Save Christians in Iraq! هذا اللحن العراقي الحزين We are being forced out of our homes. Our children are being kidnapped and beheaded. Our young boys are being crucified on the cross. We will not Mr. Speaker, imagine if a fundamentalist Christian sect captured the French city of Lyon and began a systematic purge of Muslims. Their mosques were destroyed, their crescents defaced, the Quran burned, and then all Muslims forced to flee or face execution. Such an event would be unthinkable today, and if it did occur, Pope Francis and all other Christian leaders would denounce it and support efforts by governments to stop it. Yet that is essentially what is happening in reverse now in Mosul, as the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham drives all signs of Christianity from the ancient city. Christians have lived in Mosul for nearly 2,000 years, and today they are reliving the Muslim religious wars in the Middle East. Syrians have not only a culture and a heritage that is rich, uh, but it dates back to uh, the origins of uh, civilization and what they, as a people, brought forward. So we are uh, the uh, uh, the descendants of that heritage and that history. This is only the second time in the history of the United States of America that as a genocide is taking place, that we would place that definition on what is occurring. The other was Rwanda. The persecution of Christians, Yazidis, and uh, by ISIS is, in fact, a genocide. One year since the Islamic State overran much of northern Iraq, ISIS has brutalized, raped, and murdered thousands. We have shared many, many of the horror stories, but we have also learned of one of the little Christian Christians who have overcome, and her story has inspired us all. Gary Lane traveled to Iraq and brings us her story. This year, we brought you many reports about Christians who have been forced from their homes because of ISIS right here in Iraq. But there's one little girl whose story went viral, and we thought we'd introduce you to her once again. Late last year, the world was amazed to hear a young Christian named Maryam tell a reporter she forgives ISIS. Tens of thousands of people viewed her comments on the internet. I recently caught up with the 11 year old and her younger sister Zamarad as they returned from school. Their family recently moved into a small two bedroom trailer in a community of displaced Christians in Erbil. So, why is Miriam unafraid of ISIS? And why does she forgive the jihadists who drove her from her home in Karakosh? In the Bible, Jesus said to us, don't be afraid. I am with you. And also he said, forgive others, no matter who they are hating you. You have to forgive them. Jesus is my father, and he is my creator. I have no one else better than him. When ISIS drove us out of our home, his hand was on us, and he saved us. Iraq's Nineveh Plains lie between the Kurdish North and the Arab South. The area is home to a variety of ethnic minorities, including a group of people known as Assyrians. They are descendants of the world's first Christians, whose presence here dates back to the first century AD. They speak a dialect of Aramaic, similar to the language spoken by Jesus. Anwar Isho is a book printer. Could you read something for us? Yeah, of course. 
قتيله بس it's speaking about the mother of Jesus about Mary Today, there are fewer than 250,000 Christians living in Iraq, down from more than a million at the start of the U.S.-led war in 2003. The latest threat to them has come from ISIS. The militants invaded the Nineveh plains two years ago, occupied Mosul and many of the surrounding towns. They destroyed ancient pre-Islamic art, razed the Syrian archaeological sites to the ground, and issued Christians a chilling ultimatum convert to Islam, pay taxes to us, or die. Thousands of Iraqi Christians fled Mosul, including Mayada Abdaghani, her husband, and their four children. ISIS gave them only three days' notice to leave their home, enough time to pack some clothes and family pictures. They live now in an old school building converted into refugee housing in the nearby Christian town of al Qosh, which ISIS had in its sights before Iraqi and Kurdish forces pushed them back. Now she listens to the radio for news about home, where ISIS kidnapped her brother two years ago. She hasn't heard from him since. The station makes phone calls from anti-ISIS people inside of Mosul. They phone in and let people on the outside know exactly what's going on in the city, and it's really dangerous. If ISIS catches them, they could hang them. Apparently, they just hanged four people for doing things like that. Before they set out to retake Mosul last month, the Iraqi army and the Kurdish fighters, known as the Peshmerga, both with the support from the U.S. military, began liberating small towns on the way, including several majority Christian towns like Batnaya that had been occupied by ISIS. And when did they leave? Uh, three days ago. Three days ago. This is we walked through Batnaya with Father Emmanuel Yuhana. Yuhana is a leader in the Assyrian church who runs a local Christian charity. He was anxious to inspect the town's historic church to see what damage ISIS had done. This was his first time back in two years. Is there one word to describe how you felt when you stepped through that door? Joy that the church has survived, but sadness for what was being done. In the, ch in the church. Holy books were burned. The Book of Psalms? Yes. ISIS, or Daesh as it's known here, Church left its mark. This symbol over here, yeah. Yeah. and I've seen this before. Yeah, this, is, this is by Daesh, and it's in Allah. Allah Akbar. Allah. Allah. There, Muhammad. Yeah. Ah. And here, Allah Akbar. The Islamic uh, slogans. During our visit, an improvised explosive device ISIS left behind as a booby trap detonated outside the church. Okay, okay, okay. we are in danger. No? Okay, okay, all right. Okay, so we were just told we have to get out of here because there are a lot of explosions happening, so it's time to go. Let's yeah, go. we have to go, yeah. Okay. Even if these towns become safer, that doesn't mean the Christians who were forced out will be willing or able to come back, according to Father Emmanuel. One of our immediate uh, concerns is that what will be happening in these Christian towns when, are the, when they are liberated? Because we have uh, concerns that they will be occupied. Occupied by non-Christians. Father Emmanuel says there are signs that Iraqi Muslim troops, in particular Shiites, are showing their colors in some Christian towns in an attempt to intimidate Christians. He's counting on Christian militias to protect Christian property. Douglas Aziz is a soldier in a Christian militia called Dwechnausha, meaning those who sacrifice. An air conditioning repairman and father of three little girls, Aziz helped liberate Batnaya. It was a fierce battle. Aziz says ISIS had snipers and grenades and suicide bombers on motorcycles. He shot this video while on patrol, showing how ISIS dug tunnels under the church to protect themselves from American-led airstrikes. In the end, the militiamen helped drive ISIS out. It was a proud moment when Aziz himself climbed to the top of the church in Batnaya to replace the cross. We're very happy we are winning. We want Assyrians to control this area. So this is the printing press here. Still, some in the Assyrian Christian community, like printer Anwar Isho, are pessimistic about the future. He doesn't trust the Kurds or the Iraqi government to protect them. What's the future look like for Christians in this area? It seems very dark. Yeah. Really.
if they don't have any power, if they don't have anyone to support them, they can do nothing. Only thing they can do, they will leave. So they are going to uh, Europe or to America or to Australia or to other places. So they are vanishing. Mayada Abdaghani, whose family has found refuge in the Christian town of Al-Kosh, doesn't know what she will do when the fighting stops in Mosul. Although she was comfortable living among Muslims before, she says some collaborated with ISIS, and now she's fearful of having Muslim neighbors again. That's in the past. I don't trust them anymore. She and the rest of Iraq's Christians will have to pick up the pieces as ISIS retreats. Just last week, ISIS surrendered the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud, but not before laying waste to its vast cultural heritage, dating over 1,000 years before Jesus. Father Emmanuel says ultimately the future of Christianity in Iraq will be determined by those who decide to come home to the Christian ghost towns of the Nineveh Plains. Hundreds of thousands of Christians have left Iraq. If this trend continues, aren't you worried that there may no longer be any Christians here? You know, it is a challenging question to keep the Christian uh, church alive here. And we can, we can. We will never, never give up. We might be helpless, but we are never hopeless. We at the Assyrian Christian Compassion Ministry ask fellow Christians to support the Assyrians of the Middle East through your prayers, financial support, and to also join our ministry for updates. Our mission is to improve the lives of Assyrian men, women, and children in the Middle East. Through your donations, we will be able to research their needs, find solutions, and raise funds to fulfill their need for security, food, shelter, health, and education. Thank you. At this point, we may ask, so how all of this is relevant to us who are gathered here in this hall? I personally, I learned several lessons. The hardest lesson that I learned was from that little girl whose faith give his, gives her the will to forgive ISIS and to pray for it. Emotionally, all the cells in my body revolt against that idea. But when I remember that Jesus loved me when I was his enemy and adopted me as his child, I decide that for the love of Jesus, I will stifle my emotions and resolve to pray for the enemy. I also learned from the lone man praying in a ruined sanctuary that even if the building is destroyed, it doesn't mean that the Lord is defeated and has abandoned his post. Under severe persecution, this man prays in a ruined sanctuary because he knows the Lord is still there. I envy the conviction and the faith of this man, of people like these. That's why they have survived in a hostile environment for 2,000 years as Christians. And from the sign of the cross on a refugee tent, I learned that I might be muzzled and forbidden to openly speak of Jesus here in America at school, in government offices, and secular establishments. But I will wear the cross every day and stand for Jesus using the cross as a banner. Thank you. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Amiri to resume the program. Welcome. Uh, I would like to also thank you for being here this evening with us. I'm going to uh, basically take a few more minutes and uh, let you know a little bit about uh, our organization, uh, SCCM. Basically, uh, uh, our mission uh, for SCCM, uh, we established SCCM in 2012. Uh, you know, you, you saw in the movie and in the presentation that since 2003, after the invasion of Iraq, Assyrians and the Christians in Iraq 
uh, they suffered, and their suffering just increased with time. In 2012, SECM was established to basically provide humanitarian aid to those Assyrian Christians in Iraq that were being displaced, that were being dislocated, that didn't have a place to stay, uh, to provide food, shelter, to provide uh, medication, whatever that was required. And you know, all these cases were always very urgent, right? Uh, since its establishment, ACCM, Assyrian Christian Compassion Ministry, has worked very closely with local churches, humanitarian organizations, even individuals that are in the field uh, in Iraq. As you saw, uh, uh, the pastors in the churches, these are the first people that returned to the churches that were taken away or destroyed. And the, basically, uh, the churches uh, take care of the communities that they serve. So uh, we work with them, we work with other humanitarian organizations to make sure that uh, uh, we can provide as much help as possible. For example, presently uh, we are uh, working on a campaign to uh, collect some funds and send it to them for just before Christmas. So what can we do? What, how can we help uh, the Middle Eastern Christians? One of the most important things that we can do for them is to pray because we really believe in the power of prayer. I mean, when I see that person praying in that destroyed church, and when I see those people that can be killed if they, have been, if they are seen praying, and they still continue to pray, and when I see these people not converting, not leaving Jesus, and uh, risking their lives for not doing so, uh, I become even stronger, and I believe even more of how powerful prayer is. So the first thing that we can do is to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and ask for God's hand to work uh, in, in this darkness, for, this, for his light to shine uh, among uh, those people that are there. The second thing we can do is contribute financially to projects that help the Christians of Iraq and Syria. Uh, Projects like we, we, we explained, projects like, you know, when, when these churches require, uh, they have a lot of refugees and they require food and they require to provide shelter and medication and things like that. We know and we usually, uh, you know, help to put this uh, financial aid together and send it to them. So one of the ways to do is to partner with us and contribute financially. The third and also an important step is to subscribe to our ministry to receive information. If we know about what's happening over there, we're more bound to help them than if we have no idea what's happening. So one of the things that our ministry is going to do, our um, uh, organization is going to do, is uh, to provide you with updates so that you will know what is happening. You will know where needs arise. I mean, they are all needy, let me tell you this. Uh, the majority of the population, I would say 95%, live in refugee camps, okay? They, they, uh, m almost all of them have been dislocated. They own nothing in this world except their faith, okay? So basically by subscribing to our ministry, uh, you are going to receive information about what is going on and how uh, and where we can help them. Another thing we can do is to write to our government officials here in the United States. You saw a couple of our representatives talking, and uh, uh, they know about the Syrians. And the more we ask uh, our uh, government officials, the more they are going to be active and work to protect those people over there. When you saw uh, our representative Wolf talking about what if this situation had happened to uh, Muslims in France? What would have happened, right? It is happening presently to Christians in Iraq, and it's worse, okay? So our governments are responsible to take actions, and we are responsible to let them know that we want them to take actions. So by subscribing uh, to our ministry, uh, you are going to also hear when we put up petitions together to send to government officials, and you could always sign them and join, but you could also write them yourself. 
the fourth and important thing is to partner with us, do what we do. Tell each other, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, your family members. Bring this awareness that we are bringing here today to them. Invite them to other uh, uh, presentations that we are going to have. Uh, and, and make them aware, share the news. When you subscribe, you are going to get news, news that are not always, uh, you don't hear them on TV or on radio. We are going to uh, give you updates and you could share these with your friends and family. So the next question is, why should we help? We believe this is a commandment from Jesus because we are Christians too. We believe that uh, Jesus commanded us actually here uh, in Matthew 25, 35, 36. He said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. You know, this part of the Bible, if you're familiar with it, it's talking about the judgment day, right? About the, the end. And uh, he is saying this to two groups of people. One group that says that did not do this and another group that did this, right? And the group that had done that, that were the righteous, they actually went ahead and asked, but Lord, when did we do all this for you? And in verse 40, he replies, Jesus, as the Bible says, the king, he says, whatever you do or you have done for the least of these brothers and sisters of yours, you have done unto me. So this is basically our duty to serve Christ. We need to take care of his children. So that's why we are here. That's why we brought this uh, presentation to you. We ask you, uh, I know, I mean, you know, we ask you to support us in what we do and uh, uh, help your brothers, Christian brothers in, in the Middle East. Uh, they are hurt. They live in darkness. Uh, they are attacked from everywhere. But one thing I see coming from there they are not hopeless. And I believe they are not hopeless because they are believers. They believe that God lives, Jesus lives. Thank you very much. And Michael is going to pray for us. Baba Mishmaya, Pash Kadisha Shemuch, Atiamal Kutuch, Havrezoyuch, Dahi Bishmaya Up or O, Helen Lachmas and Kana, Uduyuma, Shoklan Hoven, Dahi Upachan Shoklan Derendaran. لا مورتان جوی را با الاب هاسلان من بیشه سوادی و خیله ملکوته خیله تشبوخ دل عبد عبدین امین Thank you for coming Thank you very much